Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another edition of Ron Fuller's Studcast. I am the great Brian Last, and it's my pleasure to be with you once again as the Tennessee Stud takes us down that road of wrestling history, sharing his personal tales and anecdotes, as well as the many successes of Southeastern Championship Wrestling. But without any further ado, before we go any further, let me introduce the man himself, the man of the hour, the Tennessee Stud, Ron Fuller. Ron, how are you today? I'm great, Brian. Uh, just a really, really uh, uh, all set to go as usual. Uh, I think we're going to have a great program today. Uh, we're going to take them all different directions today and uh, got old lightning saddled up. And uh, I think we're ready to ride, man. Whenever you run a row, let's get her, get her going. Well, don't take off on lightning just yet. And I know we're going to pick up where we left off last week because we ran out of time. We didn't get to talk about the various talent moves, but real quick here at the top, Ron, I do want to mention because the reaction has been overwhelming. We knew people would like this episode, but people have loved this episode. The latest Super Studcast, part one of Super Studcast number 17 with Jimmy Golden is available right now for patrons of the Studcast at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. Only two ninety nine gets you in the door for all the content, and especially this one. You need to hear it. It is one filled with history as well as hilarity. There is a Don Kernodal story on this Super Studcast that everyone needs to hear, and you will then have the challenge of not laughing out loud every single time you ever think of it. Because I have been since we recorded it, but we'll have more information about the Super Studcast later on in the show, but I definitely want to encourage everyone to check this out. This was a ton of fun. Ron, I mentioned that we're going to pick up where we left off last week, but where exactly are we going this week? Well, uh, you kind of mentioned it already. Uh, we ended last week's studcast uh, before I got a chance to talk about uh, the next Coliseum event and uh, before I had a chance to discuss the, my first talent changes, uh, as you just said, uh, uh, for Southeastern Wrestling. I'd like to start there today, obviously, uh, but I want to add much more to this studcast. Uh, we're going to Memphis to talk about the craziness happening there, not only at the box office, but in the arena as well. And then given the time today, we want to, I want to cover the next Knoxville cart only five days after the second Coliseum show and something horrible that happened on that show that would complicate my roller coaster life in a dramatic way. And uh, so if you're ready, my man, let's just go right into it. Uh, let's begin the show today with a brief discussion about the next Coliseum show. Uh, and after Studcast number 95, which was last week, pretty much entirely about the second Coliseum show, I started thinking about my ideal date for a trip back to that big building again. And as everyone knows, if they have listened on a regular basis, I was happy with the second Coliseum show. I was happy with the crowd and the fact that it was a successful first ever Sunday afternoon card in Knoxville. I didn't want to return too soon to that building, but the ultimate decision was very much influenced by a phone call that came just three days after that second Coliseum show. And that phone call was from Sam Muchnick, the president of the National Wrestling Alliance. Uh, he informed me that I could have Jack Briscoe, the NWA world champion, on Sunday afternoon or on Sunday. He didn't care whether it was afternoon or night. April 27, 1975, uh, barely a month after this second Coliseum show. And uh, and I was uh, I would have preferred to wait a little bit, uh, maybe uh, two months before returning to the Coliseum. But dates on the world champion were really hard to come by, even for the well-established territories and uh, much less a member of much less a new member like I am of the of the NWA. So I jumped on the date because Jack Briscoe was still the champion and uh, hopefully he's going to be the champion when uh, that date comes around. And I'd worked with him recently a couple of times already for Jared. I worked for him uh, with Jack in Memphis and in Louisville already. So I knew Jack very well, obviously from being in the snake pit with him and from Jack was just kind of like a, he was a role model for me uh, when I was uh, really young and starting in Florida and I knew that when he worked with me in Knoxville, knowing that it's my town, he was going to really make me look good. So 
It turns out that uh, when I when I get to that date, April 27th, 1975, Jack does a whole lot more for me than just make me look good. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to it. But uh, by accepting this offer from Sam Muchnick, it means that I got the world champion twice in my first six months of membership in the National Wrestling Alliance. I don't think that happens to anybody and I don't think it would have happened to for me if I had not had a great relationship with Sam from all those from those couple of years working St. Louis regularly and the great relationship with Jack, which encourages Jack to say, hey, if Ron wants a shot, heck, yeah, I want to work with him in Knoxville. So, by the way, Sam. And, you know, this is for you, Brian. By the way, Sam books me in St. Louis again for January and February of 1976. And I had no idea what he had in mind in booking me for dates uh, then upcoming 76, but uh, he booked them anyway. You had worked in St. Louis a good deal before this. Had at any point you been booked for dates in St. Louis this far in advance? Because you're being booked for January and February of 76. We are in March of 75. Never, never. And uh, once I started working in St. Louis, uh, Sam called me up and said, Ron, would would you be interested in working some in St. Louis? Well, obviously, uh, no young wrestler turns that opportunity down. I said, yes, sir. I had to ask him, though. I said, Sam, have you okayed this with the Florida office? He said, I've already talked to Eddie. I've talked to your father about it. And uh, they both uh, they both would like to see you do it. So, but he never said how long this is going to be. I just assumed when I went to St. Louis the very first time that this was it. It's kind of like my uh, going to Madison Square Garden in 1973 to work for Vince Sr. Uh, and I didn't go back. Uh, but in the case of Sam, I think Sam really liked what he saw. Uh, I don't know that he'd ever seen me wrestle. In fact, when I first went there for my first show in St. Louis and Sam asked me immediately, he said, Ron, I want you back on the next show. And then it just it just started snowballing from there. Uh, I would look at my booking sheets out of Florida, and I was never, every other Friday, I was in St. Louis. So I was like, wow, this is a good deal, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm working one of the best uh, cities in the, in, the, in the wrestling world, and I'm working with some tremendous talent that I'd never have a chance to work with down here in Florida. And uh, so it was a great opportunity for me, but this one really shocks me. And he he, we're in, as you say, we're in 1975 and maybe in March, basically, of 75. And he asked me about uh, fe- January and February 1976. I'm like, wow, okay. I kind of thought maybe, God, we're going to get another run here in St. Louis. You know, I didn't really know what's going to happen, and I didn't go into any details on it because I was just thrilled to get Jack Briscoe for April 27th in the Coliseum in Knoxville. So let's get back now to some of the talent moves because we've been teasing this now for over two episodes, Ron. What was going on with you and the talent? Let's take a look at um, my first talent change. You know, you have to change talent as a booker, obviously as an owner too, uh, and it's it's just part of the business. And uh, and it's my first talent change for Southeastern. Uh, and as as regular listeners know, in the winter of 1975, I had Dutch Mantell, I had John Foley, I had Dale Lewis, I had Ron and Don Wright, I had Rocky Smith. Uh, the club fitted, club footed Benferno, and I had uh, Jimmy Golden, who had just come in and was part of the crew. And uh, two of that group actually came to me and and said they wanted to leave. Uh, Dutch had an opportunity. Dutch Mantel had an opportunity to get a good spot in a great territory, and uh, John Foley wanted to return to England. Uh, and these were the first two wrestlers ever to give me a notice as a booker and an owner. Uh, and uh, that's. You know, it's kind of odd that I even remember that, but it was the first two guys that I actually got to work for me, and uh, they were the first two to give me an, a notice to say that they wanted to go somewhere else. So, as was customary, after giving their notice, they would be leaving Knoxville in two weeks, uh, and it would happen many other times as I continued to build territories throughout my career. I was young and knew at this, uh, but I handled it in the same way and with the same philosophy as I always would. 
Because I had grown up in a wrestling family, to me, the wrestling business was designed to develop great wrestlers. Take care of them in every way you could while they worked for you and move them or allow them to go whenever they had a better opportunity. I had never felt like it was right. And this 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 stayed to the end of my wrestling career and my ownership uh, career. I never felt like it was right to hold anyone back that could better their money or their position in the wrestling business. So over the next 14 years, I'm going to develop some of the greatest wrestlers in the history of this sport. And I think they will, every one of them would tell you that I always tried to do what was best for them and not what was best for me. In your time as a promoter, these are the first two guys that left and gave notice. Did you have guys that left without giving you any notice? Uh, occasionally, yes. Uh, you know, uh, but in very rarely. Uh, guys really liked working for, for me. Uh, I, was, I was lucky that I had territories that were making money. Uh, everybody was happy in, in most of the time and making very good money. And it did not happen uh, very, very often. Uh, John, John Valiant left me in uh, Southeastern in Dothan uh, with a two-day notice. Uh, and, uh, and it really hurt me. You know, I mean, it was I wasn't accustomed to that. And uh, I and I really don't know what upset John, uh, but uh, something he didn't like and he didn't he didn't he wasn't specific. I don't think I even asked him. He said, I want to leave in two days. I, um, I want to finish up. And and I said, OK, uh, that's what you want. You know, I didn't really know him very well when he came and uh, he only was there maybe a month before he did it. But uh, oh, wow. I didn't happen very often. So, Ron, here you are. You have a couple of the guys in your crew, a couple of the first guys that you bring in, Dutch Mantel and John Foley leave. You were able to get away from the booking arrangement with the Nashville booking office, your grandfather and Nick Ullis. But part of the reason you wanted to was to have your own talent, and you had your own talent. What do you do when you lose a couple guys? You don't have any plans to bring anyone in just yet. How do you fill in that gap? Well, luckily, I'm working across the state in Memphis for Jerry Jarrett, and uh, and I'm going to rely on Jerry Jarrett uh, for the next couple of months to to help me with talent. Uh, and as you say, due do that unexpected loss of Mantell and Foley, I need a tag team. And uh, boy, he comes through strong for me. Uh, he brings in, uh, he sends me over on Fridays, uh, Jack and Jim Dalton. Uh, during this uh, couple of month time frame, uh, Ron and Don Bass, managed by Sam Bass, uh, the Infernos, and George Barnes and Bill Dundee, the great Australian team. Uh, and I'm going to also start bringing in more of my own guys. I'm, I'm going to start looking immediately for new talent. One of those guys is going to be Tommy Siegler who is a great worker at that point in his life. I'm going to bring in the original assassin, Jody Hamilton, a rock hunter, and, uh, and a young guy named George McCrary, who's uh, a pretty decent talent in his own right. Uh, so I'm going to be able to fill the holes. But, uh, you know, it kind of shocked me uh, because I wasn't expecting it. But I never wanted to hold those guys back. I was real happy to see Dutch get that spot in a great territory. And uh, obviously, John, I just think, was John Foley was just homesick. He, he wanted to go back to England. Uh, Ron, before we get to what else you were doing in this period of time, I want to ask you about a few of the wrestlers that you just mentioned. The Infernos, let's start with that. You have Rocky Smith working for you, so when you have the Infernos, is he one of the Infernos, or is it a different set of Infernos? No, he is one of the Infernos. What happens is Jerry is coming in and working a lot of these shows, and he sees Rocky Smith, and he knows Rocky Smith was the club-footed Inferno. So uh, he he asked me, he says, do you care if I start to book Rocky some? I mean, obviously you'll have him on Fridays and whatever night you want him, but I would like to put together an Inferno team. And that's where he gets his Inferno team. He goes back to the great Rocky Smith, uh, who was the man on, the, on that team. Uh, obviously, Ron and Don Bass, Sam Bass, I don't know how much, People know about Sam Bass. He was an absolutely phenomenal manager and a great person. I really, really love Sam Bass. Did you ever see Ma Bass? Uh, I never met her. 
I never saw that angle worked, uh, and she never worked for me. Neither did Ron. Now, Ron Bass is going to work for me in 1980 and 81 in uh, Pensacola. And uh, I didn't have much business dealings with Don Bass. Ron comes by himself in 1980 and 81 working for me there. Uh, but the Dalton brothers, pretty decent, especially Jim. Jim Dalton, a good worker, uh, worked uh, with uh, partners with uh, Don Fargo. Gosh, man, what a tremendous team they made, Don Fargo and Jim Foley. I mean, uh, Jim Dalton, uh, really great team. So uh, I'm very familiar with uh, with uh, Dalton, with Jim especially. And then George Barnes and Bill Dundee, I can't say enough about those two, those two guys. Well, they were just off the charts as a, as a wrestling team together. Uh, tremendous talents, both of them. One more question when it relates to this talent, Ron. Dutch Mantel is leaving, but pretty soon you're going to be bringing in, like you said, Tommy Siegler, the assassin Jody Hamilton. Tom Ernesto was retired uh, as a wrestler by this period of time, I believe. And Rock Hunter. All of those guys had worked for Ann Gunkel and All South. Did you not hold any grudge against them personally? I mean, tell me, did you have any thoughts, any concerns about bringing these guys in, considering they had run opposition to your family and the NWA? What was your mindset about using guys who would work for All South? Well, it's a few years after that all went down. And, uh, you know, gosh, I'm a young guy. I'm 27 years old. Uh, I have two guys give me a notice. I'm looking for good talent. Uh, I don't want to hold. I don't believe in holding grudges against people that do what they think in their own mind is right. And uh, and Jody Hamilton was such a phenomenal talent. And uh, my brother and I had started in Georgia in 1970 working with Jody Hamilton and Tom Ernesto. And wow, I just uh, I never forgot how good he was. And I knew what he could do for me. And uh, and I brought him there. Rock Hunter, I wasn't as, as knowledgeable about Rock, but he was very close to uh, Jody Hamilton. And uh, then when they both wanted to come, I said, absolutely. I figured, you know, uh, what happened in Georgia is in the past, and uh, it's not my territory. It was someone else's territory, and I just felt like that they had paid some dues. I'm sure that they had sat around and uh, not had opportunity for a while because of what they did, and uh, so I, I took them, uh, and I, I didn't regret it a bit. I mean, gosh, Jody Hamilton just – and Jody and I uh, – we're going to have history for 14 years after this. Jody's, this is his first time for me, but he's going to be a regular uh, down in Pensacola. He's going to be a regular with Continental. Uh, he's just, he's, he a, becomes a very close personal friend. And, uh, and I'm so happy that I did have, give him the opportunity to come in. I want to return to Knoxville in a moment, Ron, but let's go to the other side of the state this period of time, early April 1975, because Jerry Jarrett was a tremendous friend to you as a promoter, supplying you with talent, including himself, for these shows in Knoxville when you needed it, when you were still building out your crew. But you were also helping him out because he had banished Jerry Lawler from Memphis for a period of time, and you went into Memphis and you became a big star there, and you were only doing the arena shows, as we know. You never appeared on TV. But what was going on in Memphis with you at this period of time in April of 75? Actually, you know, it's, it becomes not just me at this point. It becomes the, the Welches. It becomes the Fullers. Uh, my dad comes and my brother Robert starts working there as well. And, uh, you know, the Memphis just lights up. I mean, you know, you said, uh, you know, I did well there. I mean, we just, it, it, it goes crazy. And, and I want to talk about three Monday night events here in a row. Uh, and on Monday, March 31st, uh, I lost a non-title match to Dale Lewis. And uh, the match right before me, the semifinal, was my father, Buddy Fuller, and my brother, Robert, wrestling against the great Australian team of George Barnes and Bill Dundee. The attendance that night in Memphis was 9,582 people. Uh, the next Monday night in Memphis, April the 7th, was with Dale Lewis again, but this time I successfully defended my Southern Championship against him, and my father and brother are on the semifinal that night again against the same two Australians. The attendance that night is 10,300 people. 
And the following Monday, on April 14th, I'm wrestling Jack Briscoe in Memphis for the World Heavyweight Championship with a sellout attendance of 11300 with raised prices. And it was the first time that anyone had ever talked Jerry Jarrett into raising prices for a world title match. And I suggested it to him because I had seen it happen in Florida. When uh, they brought the champion in, it was it became commonplace, and fans knew that it usually was going to cost maybe a dollar more for that event. So I suggested this to Jerry because of the huge crowds we had drawn on the two preceding Monday nights. Uh, and he told me the following Monday that Briscoe, on the world title night, was the largest gross house so far he had ever had during his time as a booker. Uh, it, it, you know, it sold out, uh, he increased the price by a dollar. And in fact, it sold out in 20 minutes. I mean, when, you know, he was concerned, we, you know, well, Ron, uh, you know, the, you, the fans aren't used to paying that. Do you think they'll pay a dollar? I said, Jerry, you'll never know till you try it, man. And, uh, and it sold out practically instantly. It was a tremendous, tremendous event for him and a tremendous night for my family as well. So uh, my photo, you know, for for this uh, stud cast number 96 is a shot of the inside of the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis with an 11,000 plus crowd like this Jack Briscoe event. And it'll give fans an idea of what more than 11,000 people in this, in a beautiful building like that look like. Uh, and if you'd like to check it out, uh, you can look on my website at tnstud.com uh, on the Studcast page or the gallery. And then when you take a look at that, fans take a look at that, just try to imagine what it's like to go out and wrestle in front of that type of crowd. I mean, it's just... It's it's a phenomenal thing to be a wrestler when you're in a building of that size and there's no seats available. No telling how many people couldn't get in that would have liked to come. Well, it certainly sounds like you proved that the Welch family has a real ability to draw in Memphis with those events. Ron, if we add up those crowds, that is upwards of 30,000 people for three events. That's pretty impressive. That's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And, uh, you know, I don't think it all, the credit shouldn't all go to us. That's for not, that's for sure. You know, and, and, and I hadn't looked at it from that angle. You know, that's a lot of people over 30,000 and three events. Uh, obviously we're, we're over pretty well. And, uh, and it's even more remarkable when you consider that I'm a heel and my father and my brother are baby faces on the same cards. And, uh, but a lot of credit must go to the city of Memphis itself and the great fans there. It's amazing to think about this fact here that when my dad went there and I was a big kid in the, in the fifth grade, uh, when he went to Memphis in 1958 and bought Memphis, his first show in Memphis drew less than 500 people. Uh, so, you know, now it's drawing 11,000 plus, and uh, it's just a testament to the city itself. Uh, it truly was Memphis, I'm talking about, was truly one of the greatest wrestling cities in the world for professional wrestling. You obviously have a very busy schedule. You're running your own territory. You're flying into Memphis for Monday nights. Do you work anywhere else in that territory during this period of time? Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm going to work uh, one one time in, uh, on April 1st in Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm going to be in a tag match with Phil Hickerson as my partner against George Barnes and Bill Dundee, and we're going to sell out the building in Louisville. On that April 1st night, uh, George Barnes and Bill Dundee are really, really over in that territory at this point. And it really doesn't make much difference who you booked with them. You're going to have a big house. Uh, so, and, and while we're on that subject, Brian, uh, something else is going on during this time frame that I think fans uh, might enjoy hearing about. Uh, I don't think there was an ever was a situation similar to what was occurring in Memphis during this three week period. I doubt there ever was a family that wrestled on the same card in which one member was a heel and the other two family members were baby faces on that same card. Uh, imagine a card in which the fans cheer the father and his youngest son 
in one match. And the very next match, the main event, they boo like crazy the older son. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it, it, it's, 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 it, I don't think that's ever happened. I don't know in my career, I'd never seen that happen where family members were on opposite sides uh, in opposite dressing rooms and, and one group gets cheered and the other one gets booed. Uh, so it was a strange situation, but uh, it, we were doing really, really phenomenal business there. On the first of those three cards, on that Monday night, March 30, March 31st, my father and brother wrestled against the Australians as baby faces, and I wrestled the next match, obviously, as a heel. Uh, I've got the crowd itself. Uh, i got to give the crowd itself credit for switching me from heel to baby face over this next two-week period. Uh, I'm not – Jerry and I, Jared had, had not discussed making me a baby face. And I don't think Jerry wanted to make me a baby face. But what happens in these two mat tag matches on these two weeks is going to make me a baby face uh, because the fans are going to make it happen. I've never seen that happen either. Uh, so on this first of three huge Mondays, the fans are going crazy with my brother and my father in their tag match with the Aussies. And I'm standing in the back of the building and watching and right in plain sight of the all 9,500 people on that first night, March 31st, there's 9,582 people there. Uh, the third Aussie, there's a third Aussie in the territory, a guy named Johnny Gray, and he's standing right beside me. And, the, and I can see the crowd hardly takes their eye off of me because – there, I'm standing there watching my father and my brother wrestle against two Australians, and their buddy is standing right next to me. It's a strange situation for the crowd, and it's a strange situation for me. So I get, I, I can tell that the crowd's watching both of us, and I think they're anticipating what's going to happen if Johnny Gray leaves my side and goes down there to get involved in that match. And toward the end of the it was a great tag match. Uh, toward the end of that match, that's exactly what happens. The Aussies get in trouble, and Johnny Gray, I mean, he charges off to the ring and uh, help his countrymen make the match uh, now two against three, and uh, and they ultimately win this match against uh, my dad and my brother. And I stood there and watched them uh, open Rob up, I saw him start bleeding, and then they piled drive my dad right in front of me, and I never made a move to help him. Uh, the fans were screaming at me, go, go, Ron, go help him, go help him. And in fact, as the, as the end was going down and my brother was still bleeding and my father was being stretchered out, the crowd was focused on me. I walked back into the dressing room to a building full of booze from the entire crowd. But when I came out the next, very next match for the main event to wrestle against Dale Lewis, I had more heat than I had ever had in Memphis. The crowd would not stop booing me. And Dale Lewis, it was his first night there. When we were being introduced, he, he says to me in the ring, he goes, how in the world did you get this much heat, man? <laughs> you know, he couldn't figure out. You know, but what I did and by standing there and not going to help to my brother and my father, I became a monster heel right then. They hated me. So that's week one. You mentioned there were three shows. What did you do week two? Well, the next week, uh, the crowd goes up. It's over It's over 10,000 the following week, 10,300. And uh, the same tag match who was with Rob and my dad against Barnes and Dundee was again right before my match. And uh, the Mid-South Coliseum is a huge round structure. Uh, it has the entrances built into the back of the building for bringing trucks, semi-trucks into the building and dropping off stages and whatever else they huge trucks could drive in both sides of the back of that building. And where those trucks entered, they had these huge metal screens that raised and lowered for access. So on that night, the huge metal screens were lowered. And uh, and there were, again, the Johnny Gray and I standing side by side watching the match that we had watched the, the Monday night before in which he got involved. Uh, 
And so everyone, again, was focused on us just as much as the match. I mean, it was exactly like the the week before. And toward the end of the match, Johnny Gray, here he goes. He takes off. He charges down to the ring to help his friends. And I stand there and watch again, as I had done the week before. The crowd was going absolutely nuts. They could not believe I was going to do it again. And uh, they were literally screaming over the railings and begging me, go help them, go help them. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and uh, and then I turned to go back into the dressing room, as I'd done the week before. And as soon as I turned and headed for the dressing room, the roof came off. They booed. They, they weren't even watching the match. They were watching me, and they just started booing me like crazy. And I disappeared from their view. And when I walked around the corner, I didn't go in the dressing room. They wouldn't stop. They were still booing. And so I just, I turned. I couldn't, I couldn't leave. So, uh, and, and both my father and, and Rob were ble- bleeding in this particular match. And the crowd persistence, man, they, they just brought me back into the building. And uh, boy, when I suddenly came out of that dressing room again, through that door and went to the ring, the roof came off that place. I had never heard that building so loud. Uh, and I ran to the ring and I just grabbed Johnny Gray. He was on the floor at that point by the, by the back of his head and by his hair. And I started running with him toward the back of that building. And he was running by me. He had no choice. If he'd have gone down, I would have slammed his face in the concrete. So he had to try to keep up with me. And I ran him toward that giant metal screen in the back of that building. I don't think anybody ever did this before or since in Memphis. And when we were about 10 feet away from that screen, I just shot his body up into the air. And he hit that metal screen about 10 feet off the floor. He took the best bump backwards I had ever seen on the concrete concrete floor uh the crowd popped uh, and i just went right back into the dressing room as the as he laid there until his countrymen minutes later after they lost the match they came and peeled him off the concrete i guess he stayed there for five minutes uh, so uh, that's kind of why i said earlier that the fans in this particular instance they turned me baby face uh, it was not something jerry wanted to happen i don't believe but i just felt like god i can't do this two weeks in a row i can't just walk to the dressing room and let that happen twice in a row so uh, when i went back for the main event after i did that I got a standing ovation as soon as I, as soon as they saw my face come out of the dressing room, the building stood up. And uh, it was one of those times I got those chill bumps that many wrestlers hated to see. And, uh, and I was never, ever booed in Memphis again after that. Let's return to Knoxville. What's going on in Knoxville? Well, next up is the Knoxville card uh, back in Chai Park, Chai Park uh, just five days after the Coliseum card. Uh, for listeners that are joining us for the first time, and gosh, we've got a lot of those, uh, Brian, uh, uh, that we're, our numbers just keep growing. Uh, Studcast 95 would give them all the details about that second Coliseum show if they missed that one or they'd like to hear about that. But we have no TV to advertise this card for Friday, March 28th. We wrestle on Sunday, March 23rd, and there's no television or anything to to advertise this Friday, March 28th card. And that had worried me all week about how we were going to drop off significantly because that we didn't have a TV to push the next next event. But uh, we still had amazingly good crowd in the smaller Chilhowee Park building. And I think that might have happened because we had a lot of brand new fans that attended the Coliseum show and then came for the first time ever to the small building. Uh, What is happening with these Coliseum shows, I believe, is these first two Coliseum shows were creating interest that started making new fans for us. And uh, many of Many of those fans, I believe, were not willing to go to Chilpai Howie Park building until now. Once they went to the Coliseum and they saw it and they got a little taste for it, uh, they are, they're willing then to go to the small building because we're starting to hook them. We're starting to make fans out of them. Uh, and it, to me, was proof that things were changing when it came to wrestling in Knoxville. We were headed in the right direction, and I really felt that 
on that Friday night when we're still almost full in the small building and we've had no television or anything to even advertise on it. So let's go to this show, Ron. Let's go to your return to Chill Howie Park Friday night, March 28th, 1975. Well, the first match on that card uh, was Tojo Yamamoto uh, beating uh, tag ch- uh, former tag champion John Foley. Uh, like I said, I'd gotten a notice from him. Uh, so, you know, there's no need, obviously, uh, to, to put them over. And Tojo has been there on a few shows, and he's starting to get over. And uh, in the second match, uh, Dutch Mantel, the other guy that's leaving, happens to be wrestling against Jerry Jarrett. And, uh, and he... And Dutch puts Jerry over by disqualification, and and I thought that was good. Uh, I was happy with Dutch, and I was happy with the way that John Foley left. Uh, and uh, that pleased me that I had Jerry as one of those guys that uh, he's really helping me at this point. And he's there himself, and he's starting to get over a little bit there as well. The third match on this card is a well, I want to spend a little time match uh, with. Uh, and this is Danny Hodge against uh, my cousin Jimmy Golden. Uh, and uh, these same two guys had wrestled against each other in the Coliseum just five days earlier. And they had a fantastic 30-minute time limit draw match. One of the great ma- wrestling matches that you will ever see. Fantastic match. Uh, so this match is now 45-minute time limit for that reason, because the time limit ran out at 30. Uh, I said, let's put this at 45. Let's see what the heck happens here. Uh, and at the beginning of the match, Hodge shook hands with Golden in the middle of the ring before the bell. And when Jimmy turned to walk back to his corner, the bell rang. Hodge attempted a quick win. He he wanted to beat him really fast. And he rushed Jimmy from behind and attempt to O'Connor roll him uh, backward. uh, After smashing uh, him in the corner, he intended to roll him up. And, but Jimmy was too smart for that. He was, I don't know. I I was really surprised. Jimmy reversed it when he ran him, when he grabbed him from behind and he started to shove him to the corner. Jimmy just stuck that arm in there. Uh, right in front of Hodge's leg. He flipped himself around behind Hodge, kept him running, and Jimmy jammed Hodge into the corner and rolled him up instead. The referee counted Hodge out, and the crowd popped. I was like, I popped. I'm standing up there watching. I was like, whoa, wow. Because <laughs> no one had ever beaten Hodge that fast. I'm sure. And there's no doubt. And Danny went berserk. I mean, he, you know, he just was uh, jumping around and, and banging the ropes. Jimmy slid out of the out on the floor. The crowd just mobbed him, man. It was like, wow, it's unbelievable. You beat Danny Hodge in, in six seconds or something. So, you know, and and Hodge goes nuts. I mean, he he demands the microphone uh, from the announcer. The announcer says, "Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the match in six seconds or whatever is a uh, Jimmy Golden." And Hodge just grabs the microphone away, and uh, and he starts claiming that the hey the bell rang before before it should have, and he had all these excuses, and he kept telling Jimmy, he kept begging him, come back, come back here, man, uh, you know. And Jimmy's he's all surrounded by fans. He's headed to the dressing room, and the fans boo Hodge like crazy. And Danny continues to scream at Jimmy on the microphone, come back to the ring for a second try. You can't do that again. You'll never beat me again. And uh, Jimmy finally agrees to give him a second match. And so Jimmy goes back to the ring. The, the crowd kind of settles down just a little bit. They get ready to go again. They ring the bell. They shake hands just like they did in the first one. They shake hands again. And and this time, when Hodge turns to go to his corner and, and the bell is already rung, Jimmy tries to pull the same trick. He rushes Hodge from behind, and Hodge reverses him. And Jimmy's smart enough and fast enough that he re-reversed Hodge and slammed him in face first again, rolled him up, and the – Referee counts him out again. One, two, three. Oh, my God. The crowd went absolutely crazy, man. Now he's beaten Danny Hodge twice in 12 seconds. I mean, Hodge just was absolutely livid. I mean, Jimmy left the ring. He, The fans were just all over him. Jimmy was a star. That made a absolute star out of Jimmy in that one match. And uh, Danny was really upset. 
when he got back to the dressing room and uh, his anger is because of what went down is going to cost me a lot of money uh, in the very next match. Danny wasn't crazy about the finish being him <laughs> getting pinned in 12 seconds. No, no. He, you know, he, <laughs> you know, he, he's like, you know, gosh, man, that, 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 how can you, you know, that'll get him over. I said, that's exactly, that's the point, Danny, that will get the kid over, you know? And, uh, they could have gone out there and had another long match, uh, and had another draw. Uh, Jimmy would have not, he would have left that ring after 45 minutes and not been nearly the star he was with a finish like that. Uh, but Danny didn't really like the idea. And, uh, and he was a little bit upset. Uh, you know, he'd never, you know, we, I think we talked uh, in the last episode or so about Danny uh, had was 46 and 0 as an amateur at the University of Oklahoma and never had anybody even take him down. He had Jimmy Golden beat him twice in 12 seconds. It was like, wow, I really appreciated what Danny did for Jimmy. And so did Jimmy, obviously. You mentioned earlier when talking about Memphis that you went in there and you main evented against Dale Lewis. Of course, Dale Lewis is working for you on the other side of the state here in Knoxville. And in fact, you guys team up on this night. Yes, we do. Uh, in fact, uh, on the Coliseum show, Nelson Royal and Les Thatcher won the Tennessee Heavy Tennessee Tag Championships from Mantell and Foley, and we're going to wrestle them for those titles. Uh, that's the main event for the night. And uh, and Dale insisted that he still wants to take on a challenger from the crowd before the tag match. And you know, and I thought, well, that, I don't see how that's going to fit in here, Dale. But he says, you know, Ron, it's it's what we do, and and you know, there's going to be guys, there's going to be challengers out there that want to do it. And so I said, well, I tell you what, why don't we do it before the the semi match, which is a ladies' world championship match with uh, Fabulous Moolah. She was scheduled for the fourth match. I said, let's have one person. You you will just beat one challenger this night, and uh, then we'll go back in the main event. So he agreed on that. And, uh, you know, the fans had seen a lot of these challenge matches with guys from the crowd. Uh, Dale was only going to beat one guy, as we agreed upon. And when the challenge match was ready to start, I was standing on the second level of the building, uh, and you look down on the ring. It was a smaller building. They had bleachers up on that second level as well. But the side where the dressing room was, there were no bleachers and no people, basically. That was all cut off from fans, and they couldn't get in that particular area. And I always watched matches from that second level looking straight down on the ring. And guess who joins me and stands right beside me watching that match from the same level as I uh, Danny Hodge, <laughs> you know, Danny watched all these shoots. And as I have said repeatedly in the last few super red, last few stud casts that he has, he has, he's upset with the way Dale is handling this. And now Danny's, you know, he wasn't real happy with the finish here. And uh, now he's, he's standing there watching me uh, with me watching Dale down there. And that night, this opponent's a little larger than most of the guys that Dale had been wrestling, and he seemed to be cocky and trying to act tough even before the bell rang. Uh, he seemed to me like a real jerk. You know, I'm watching and I'm thinking, no, oh, this guy's a, he's an ass, man. You know, what, <laughs> what's his deal, you know? Uh, and And I got a real bad feeling in the pit of my stomach about, about this guy and you know uh, i don't know why but uh I, I remember i felt like wow you know well, this guy's just something something wrong with this dude you know so lewis locks up with him and uh at the very beginning of the match i rang the bell and he backs him into the ropes uh, right off right off the bat and uh and the referee calls for a break lewis throws up his hands for a clean break and then he does this with all of these challenge matches because he's going to take these guys and there's no doubt that they can, they're never going to touch Dale Lewis. Uh, but, uh, you know, he throws his hands up and he back starts to back away. And, uh, the, the jerk, the guy he stick tries to stick his fingers in his eyes. And it, and it was so obvious that Danny's standing right next to me. We both see it. And we both recognize that this guy's trying to, trying to hurt Dale. 
He's trying to he's trying to do something that I have not seen any challengers do. So he he tries to stick his fingers in Dale's eyes, and Dale didn't even seem to get upset because he's so low key and everything. And he backed away, and he's in complete control. But Danny standing next to me, he's a totally different animal, by golly. <laughs> and he starts screaming at Dale from where we are up in the balcony. And he screams down there and he goes, hurt him. You know, and I turn to Danny and say, no, Danny, no, no. He has this under control. Uh, so Dale locked up again. Uh, they go back together. Dale locks up again with the guy. And, he, and this time he forces the guy back into the corner. And the referee calls for the break again. Dale throws his hands up in the air and starts to back away. And the guy takes a swing at him. And uh, Dale grabs the guy pretty firmly. And he just takes him down on the mat. But Danny's still standing next to me. (laughs) And now instead of saying hurt him, Danny screams at him again. He says, kill him. (laughs) (laughs) And in an instant, I mean, you know, I, I can't even turn to, stay, to say something to Danny. He's gone. He heads to the ring. He goes down the steps and uh, down to the first floor, and he's right up to ringside. And he's screaming at Dale all the way down there, kill him, kill him. You know, and, and I'm screaming just as loud as, as, as Danny is. At Danny, I'm going, no, Danny, no, no, <laughs> no, please, please don't get involved, you know. So by the time Danny gets to the ring, Dale had the guy on his back, and he was about to pin him. Uh, it would have all been over right then if it had not been for Danny. But Danny arrives at the ring about the point where this guy's down and Dale's about to just pin him and get this done. And uh, once Danny gets to the ring, he's screaming so loud, I can hear him up at the top of the building. Everybody in the building can can hear him. And uh, so when he arrives at ringside, he screams at Dale, and he's pretty close to where Dale is now. And he goes, don't you pin that son of a bitch. Stop him in the face. And I go, oh, no, no. I'm thinking, oh, my God, no, no. So I can hear what had Danny screaming and, uh, you know, way up on the second floor. So I start screaming. Um, <laughs> Dale, I scream, no, Dale, don't do it. Pin <laughs> him. Go on a pin him, man. You know, but he can't hear me, right? So, and he's close to Danny, so he can obviously hear what Danny said. And so he plainly hears Danny's demands. As everybody else in the building hears Danny's demands. And uh, Dale's in the process, basically, of about to pin him. And uh, he's on top of him. And Danny's only a few feet away from him now. He's right there at ringside. And he screams again really loud. He says, if you don't stomp that son of a bitch in the face, I'm going to come in there for you. (laughs) Wow. Oh my gosh! Now it's re- it's gone to another level here, right? I'm like, oh my goodness, no! So you know, almost every wrestler on earth fears Danny Hodge, and Dale Lewis is no exception. I can tell you that. So uh, Dale gets up off the guy, and the, the guy's laying there helplessly because he's blown up, and Dale's been, you know, he's roughing him up a little bit when he took the swing at him. Uh, so Danny screams again. Now the guy's laying on his back and he's, he's blown up and, and basically he would have been finished and out of the ring and would have been done with. But, uh, Danny's right there and he screams one more time. He says, stomp that son of a bitch in the face, Dale. And I go, I scream as loud as I can. One last try. Don't do it, Dale. Pity, pity. <laughs> I'm just begging. No, Dale, don't do it. Uh, Dale stands there. He, he's, he doesn't know what to do. Until he sees Danny reach and get the ropes like he's going to come up on the apron. And that's as far as he's going to. That's as close as as Dale wants Danny. I can tell you that. He doesn't want Danny in that ring with him. So, uh, so. And as far away as I, I am, I can see the fear in Dale's eyes. I, I know it's all over here. I, yeah, you know, so I, well, one last scream. Oh, I got to try once more. Dale, don't do it, man. Don't stop him. You know, but it's too late. Well, I see Dale raise that big old size 14 foot. And I mean, down it comes. Gosh almighty. Blood shoots across the ring. And the jerk's laying there motionless, man. And then soon he's covered in blood. Uh, Dale leaves the ring. 
He puts his foot on his chest, and the referee counts the guy out. He's a bloody mess, and uh, and he leaves the ring. And when he leaves, Danny's right by his side, uh, you know. And in my opinion, Danny's forced this. This is all Danny's fault. I mean, he forced Dale to do something Dale would have never done himself. Uh, so I, you know. Uh, and all the way back to the dressing room, Danny's right in Dale's face, giving him crap, you know, because he had, I guess, because he didn't stomp him soon enough. I don't know what he would disliked about the way he stomped him, but <laughs> it was, it was a bad deal. So, uh, so I had to make a quick decision how best to handle this catastrophe, you know, and, and, and I thought at the moment, uh, my night was ruined and, and so was my future, man. <laughs> this, this is just as Horrible a thing as could possibly have happened in uh, in 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 my first few months as a wrestling owner. Well, two quick questions, Ron. When a guy got into the ring for a challenge match with Dale Lewis, did they have to sign anything? Did they have to say, "I won't sue," even if I get stomped in the face or anything else? And secondly, he had been working for you for a while as a heel, but had you ever seen Danny Hodge this angry? Uh, no. No, I had never seen Danny that angry. And yes, there was a document that was signed. I had it drawn up by an attorney before we ever started doing these challenge matches because I anticipated somebody might get hurt. And uh, basically, the document says that uh, you take uh, you take all, all the responsibility in your own hands and uh, you realize that you're out there trying to win money and that if you get injured in the process, that... Uh, you can't do anything about it. But gosh, when I'm standing up there and looking at this guy's bloody face and, and he's unconscious, uh, I'm wondering, you know, is this gone way past the, the point of no return here? You know, it's like uh, I know he signed the document, but uh, because we had everybody do it that went in the ring with Dale. But, uh, you know, Danny was just out of total control here. Maybe, you know, he just disliked the finish with uh, Jimmy so much, the concept of losing twice in the same way in the, in the 12 seconds that it just it turned his night upside down, and he turned my night upside down because of it. I can tell you that. That's for darn sure. Well, we still have a couple more matches on the show, including you and Dale Lewis teaming up. Obviously, this was not in your plans when you started booking out the show, but there's also a women's world championship match on the show, or maybe I should say the world's ladies championship. Talk about that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're going to wrestle for the Tennessee tag titles, but uh, the next matchup is uh, the fabulous Moolah against... Uh, against her opponent and uh it really didn't make any difference who her opponent was because moolah had trained most of those girls anyway and uh you know uh, she, she was definitely in control with uh with all of uh, all of her matches and uh, with the people that she trained uh, she was the woman that when it came to it, and she's wrestling against Ann Casey that night, who is a very polite and nice girl, uh, and uh, just uh, just a pleasure to be around. And Mula, uh, just uh, uh, mean and vicious. I mean, uh, that's 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 the way I would have to describe her. She was really mean and vicious in the ring, and she had no pity on these girls that she trained. Uh, uh, I cringed a few times myself just watching what the ladies' world champion was capable of. I mean, Mula was, wow, she was as as bad as uh, as any shooter you'd ever see. And and actually, she had some shooter capability. She had been trained by people that uh, that had taught her how to wrestle and how to hurt people. And she, she, she had no qualms about doing it with these lady wrestlers that she had trained. And, uh, uh, over the next 14 years, I'm going to, I'm going to become somewhat friends with, with Lillian Ellison. That's fabulous Moolah. And I'm going to use her on a, quite a few really big shows, uh, where I want to have triple world championships. I want to have a world heavyweight NWA world title on the line. I want to have an NWA 
uh, junior heavyweight championship title on the line, and I want to have a world's ladies title on the line. And I do that quite a bit uh, over the next 14 years, and Lillian is going to work for me quite a few times, uh, and she is going to wrestle on some of the biggest crowds Southeastern and Continental are going to ever draw. Hey, one question, Ron, uh, because I know he was centered out of, I think, Nashville. Did you ever meet Buddy Lee? Moolah's ex-husband, who later would marry Rita Cortez? Buddy Lee and my father were great friends. Uh, Buddy Lee was in the music business. Uh, and uh, I never met Buddy Lee, but I remember my dad talking about Buddy Lee a lot. Uh, he was a huge wrestling fan, and uh, and I don't know exactly what he did. He was a producer in the music business or whatever. He's in Nashville. I mean, obviously, he's in a great city for that. But... Uh, uh, I wasn't even aware that Lillian had married Buddy Lee, to be honest with you. See, I don't do my research like you do, Brian. I don't, I, <laughs> I, I don't dig into, into, uh, into, into all the things that I should. So but I, that's, uh, that's kind of shocking to me because my dad mentioned Buddy Lee many, many times and uh, had a great friendship and a relationship with Buddy Lee. So let's now go to this main event, Ron. The Tennessee Tag Team Championship on the line. The champions, Les Thatcher and Nelson Royal versus Ron Fuller, yourself, and Professor Dale Lewis. Yes, and, and you know, bear in mind now, this has been a crazy night when we go to the ring. Uh, and, you know, I'm not myself. Uh, Dale Lewis is not himself at this point. Uh, Danny Hodge has certainly not been himself during the course of this night. It's been a wild and crazy evening for me. And uh, so in this match, uh, I'm going to leave Dale Lewis uh, in the end of this match alone by himself with both Nelson Royal and Les Thatcher. Just basically walk away from him uh, when he's trying to get a tag and when he's trying to his best to for us to win the match i'm just going to step off the apron and just go straight to the dressing room and obviously uh, by the time i leave they shoot in there and they double team him and and by the time i make it to the dressing room and look over uh they're they're finishing him off <laughs> in the ring and uh and uh, that's the first match that Dale Lewis has lost since he came to Knoxville. And I have left him in there. And uh, the next week, on the next Friday night, I'm going to be wrestling against him for my Southern Heavyweight Championship because I left him. But because of the way the tag match ended, then obviously I'm going to defend against him the next Friday night. And uh, it's been a crazy night. Like I said, uh, I've never been in this in this type of circumstances before. Uh, the events of this night obviously are fresh in my mind at that point. And uh, and I'm like I said, now I'm in as bad a mood as Hodge and Lewis are. And uh, the tag match that I just ended was pretty much a blur to me. I, I really don't remember a whole lot of the tag match, to be honest with you, but because. As we're in the ring and as this is going down, I watch them take this guy that Dale has bloodied up, this challenger, out on a stretcher to an ambulance that's outside with its lights flash. And you can see it through the windows of the building. And uh, he looks like he's unconscious. And they've got his neck in a brace. Uh, uh, that, that was it for me. I mean, you know, the, that... That's I think that's the point. I got off the apron and just went to the dressing room. Um, I was finished. And I really felt like I was not just finished uh, with that night, that maybe I was finished as an owner of a company. I had no idea what to expect out of this horrible thing that had taken place during the course of this night. Uh, and it was un undoubtedly one of the worst nights of my wrestling career. Two quick questions before we wrap things up, Ron. One, as you're watching this guy, this fan being taken out on a stretcher, bloody, are you thinking all the things? Are all the, is everything going through your head? I'm going to get sued. I'm going to get shut down. This is going to be a problem. And also, in terms of this main event match, you clearly, if you look at the lineups, you were ready for another top babyface. And 
you against Professor Dale Lewis would have been a really good long-term program because you've been building him up for months. This is the first time he loses a match here, and it's you that cost him the match. Instant babyface right there. Right away, you have an instant challenger, and we have a brand new babyface. But these events happen. Does that change the way you think about what you're going to be able to do? Well, you know, you're right about the first part. Uh, you know, I, I just I started seeing all these things, you know, lawsuits and, and, you know, just problem after problem and and how it could have all been avoided if Danny had just left the situation alone. Uh, and you're right also about uh, Dale being a great baby face. I mean, he's been a heel with me side by side. For months, uh, he has not been beaten. Uh, I have not been, I've not lost a lot of matches either. And it was a perfect setup to bring him back as a baby face. But I think uh, as time goes by here, a lot of things are going to happen in the next couple of weeks here that are going to change everything. <laughs> you know, this stomp in the face goes way beyond just one guy being injured. It's going to affect Danny. It's going to affect Dale. Uh, and it's going to affect me. Well, I guess that's a good time to wrap things up, and we'll certainly see where this goes next time with all of this. But, Ron, as we do close out this show, we want to remind everyone that you are on Facebook, and we encourage everyone to join your Facebook page, Ron Fuller, the Tennessee Stud. You can also follow the Stud on Instagram and Twitter at Ron Fuller Welch. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. And I also want to mention that the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network is on Twitter at Super Podcasts, as well as on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. We talked about it a little earlier. Super Studcast number 17 with Ron's cousin Jimmy Golden is a big hit right now with patrons around the world. Check it out. Part one is up. Part two is coming very, very soon, and you will love it. Check out the first 90 minutes right now at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. It's only $2.99 to get you in the door. It's the best deal in wrestling, and there are so many action-packed, history-packed Super Studcast and rest of the stories out there. You definitely need to check it out. We have a lot of new listeners, like you mentioned earlier, Ron. We encourage you, if you enjoy what we bring you each and every week on the Studcast, check out the Super Studcast, patreon.com slash studcast or tnstud.com. Ron, where are we going next week? Well, we're going to go back and revisit our, my commentator problem that is still there with Big Jim Hess and how that problem is going to lead to probably the most important decision I will ever make concerning southeastern wrestling in knoxville uh plus there's no way we can avoid going back and going dipping right back into this this thousand dollar challenge disaster as i call it i guess is a good word for it and how i'm going to deal with hodge and lewis because of this uh, uh it's 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 pretty remarkable how things in wrestling work and uh and this is this is really a it's a it's a tough time for a 27 year old young owner of a brand new wrestling company. And we're going to see what I'm made out of. Ron Fuller's Studcast is a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network for the Tennessee Stud Ron Fuller. I'm the great Brian Last. The story continues next week.